because this will kill you, but it will appear in multiple choice or somewhere else. So it turns out when we do this impact of the change in fixed costs, you cannot be intuitive. You have to follow the economic logic or you don't get there. So that's extremely important. This is a real test of your ability to follow the logic. So we're going to do that. We're going to get that done in like the first half hour. Then we're going to do it all over again in the sense that we're going to talk about the long run. Now, so in the short run, let me, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open by briefly reviewing what you're supposed to know. Well, everything falls together. I've got like whatever it is, 20 pages of notes. Marginal product, all this kind of stuff, marginal cost, then uh, you know, uh, profit maximization explaining in various ways. It all comes down to basically three diagrams, derivation and supply function in the short run, and we see what happens. So I want to review that and make sure we're comfortable with it. I've got it right there the way I want to review it. And then having done that, uh, I'll then move ahead and say, now the next step will be this, and we're not going to do it quite yet. Uh, the long run, I'll briefly explain that, but not too much, just as an overview of what we're going to do today. And then we'll do the impact of a change in fixed costs. All right? And then I'll give you an example of real life how this actually worked out. So, so um, Practice exams, there's also 
derivation of income and substitution effect, you will not be doing that, but you'll be driving demand. You will be then moving on to, uh, you know, you should understand the behavior of marginal product and average product, but obviously, and that could be a smaller question, than are here for lunch or whatever, but you always have to know the behavior of the, the uh, cost functions, uh, marginal cost, average cost, and all that, and the short run equilibrium firm and industry diagram for an increase or decrease in demand, variable cost, or fixed cost, and the long run equilibrium effect of those kind of things. And that's what this exam is going to cover. All right? Plus understanding what it's all about. Tuesday, if you have any more questions on it, you can ask them, but today we'll just proceed. Okay, now look, follow this. I'm telling you, this is the sequence. It's the sequence that explains that which in many ways is inexplicable, which is this. In a firm that the supply curve is up to slope, the more you produce, the more it costs. Why is that? Why doesn't it cost less? As we see, as I say, we're going to see in the long run. In the long run, the more you produce, the less it costs, probably because you're using bigger machines, bigger building, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But for us, in the short run, the more you produce, the more it costs, and the reason for that is this sequence of events. Capital is, the short run implies capital is fixed. Capital is fixed implies that marginal product, I don't have it in sleeve one here, this is marginal product. Marginal product right here, this is marginal product. This is average product. Because capital is fixed, marginal product rises and then falls. It rises because when capital is fixed, as you add workers, they can specialize and the group can produce more as you add workers at a greater rate. Uh, but beyond some point, you have a fall in marginal product. We call this eventually falling uh, returns, diminishing returns, eventually diminishing returns. Falling marginal product because because you have fixed capital, now the workers are having trouble having access to that capital and productivity falls. So we have that shape. Then we have that shape of marginal product. Please understand your understanding of marginal product. Even though we don't spend a lot of time in this course from now on, your understanding of marginal product defines everything. Marginal product defines average product because if the margin is rising and Above the average, the average rises. The, margin, the average cuts the margin when the average is at a maximum. So therefore, when I want to know maximum average product, it's where our maximum average product is where, well, where marginal product equals average product. Keep it in the back of your mind because there's other reasons for knowing that. So marginal product is because of fixed capital and its behavior defines average product. Marginal product defines marginal cost. Marginal cost is the cost of additional variable unit, or sort of output, by changing variable units. So you're, the cost of the variable units divided by the output of the variable units. For simplicity's sake, we said the cost of the variable units is W. So marginal cost is W divided by MP. You should know that. I derive it, but you don't have to derive it which shows you very clearly if marginal product goes up, given that W is fixed, it's an assumption we make for simplicity, if marginal product goes up, it must be that marginal cost goes down, if marginal product goes down, it must be that marginal cost goes up. So marginal cost falls when marginal cost goes up, is at a minimum when marginal product is at a maximum, and maximum here, and rises when marginal product falls. Average variable cost is W divided by AP, so it's the you know, analog of this one, AP, but don't have to worry about that. The one thing to remember is because the margin is falling, and below the average, the average is falling. When the margin equals the average, the average will be at a minimum, and when the margin is above the average, the average will rise. So again, I cannot reiterate more enough. Marginal product dictates the behavior of average product, Marginal product dictates the behavior of marginal cost and of average variable cost. Then we saw that given that, and in, for a competitive firm, we said that profit maximization in general implies 
marginal revenue equals marginal cost. I'll revisit that later when we do our first step. But for a competitive firm, mar what, what marginal revenue is the revenue from an additional unit. Cost is the cost of an additional unit. And you see here that the marginal cost is not constant because the marginal product is not constant. And marginal revenue, by the way, for a market is not constant. For the industry as a whole, marginal revenue is not constant because demand is down the slope. We'll talk about that more with the monopoly. Marginal revenue is not constant in an industry because if you produce more, if the industry produces more, uh, price falls, the demand curve is down and so forth. But for an individual firm in an industry, marginal revenue is constant. It is equal to the price. You can think of it this way. In the world, if the output of wheat goes up, up in the world, the price of wheat goes down in the world. But for the individual farmer, this is irrelevant. For the individual farmer, when they get up in the morning, there's the price of wheat. It has nothing to do with them. If they produce more or less wheat, so far as they're concerned, it doesn't affect the price of wheat. If they're the only one to produce more wheat, the price of wheat would never change, right? So for the individual farmer and the individual consumer, for the individual consumer, what farmer marginal revenue is constant as price. For the, uh, for the individual consumer, marginal cost, the cost of anything is constant as price, right? So therefore, our formula which of course has this symbol, the most important formula in microeconomics, MR equals MC, which applies for all firms. For competitive firms, is exactly the same, but simplified. Simplified, because price equals marginal revenue. So therefore, in competitive world, profit is maximized at that output where price equals marginal cost. So then we did that, and we showed that for any given price, the firm would produce the output where price equal marginal cost. That means that, given that a supply function is the quantity supplied at any given price, setters paribus, and the setters paribus conditions are satisfied, such as technology and the price, the cost of inputs and all that stuff. Therefore, the marginal cost function is the supply function of the individual firm. And this turns out to be of great significance. When I ask you to draw this thing about fixed cost, every, whenever I say something to you, before you draw anything, you go, wait a minute, the supply function is the marginal cost function. Understand? This you must remember, or you will screw up. So I mean, this will be help you understand why that's so. So the marginal cost function defines the supply function of the firm. Not the fixed cost, not the average cost, not nothing, nothing like that. It turns out, for example, see this thing right here? This could be the price right here. Say that was the price, um, like that. There is the price. Do you realize that if the average cost was here, the firm would produce still the same output and would be maximizing or profit or minimizing loss? In this case, there would be a loss. If the average cost function was here, the firm would still produce exactly the same output. In short, the output, the profit maximizing output of the firm has nothing to do with the actual fixed cost. It has only to do with the marginal cost. Now it turns out the marginal, that formula tells you exactly the output that maximizes profit or minimizes loss. Then you have to look at average cost to determine whether or not you've got a profit or a loss or you're going to shut down, right? So we saw again here just to remind you the basic idea that you do not think the firm maximizes profit here at this output, even though this is minimum uh, average cost, because for every unit the firm produces beyond that output, this little triangle right there, this triangle right there, is an addition to profit, because as they produce more, and again, you know, all what you want to do is integrate the stuff with the stuff that's most common in your own life. Supposing you had hours in a week to work, and I'm going to pay you $15 an hour. You have some $10 hours and some $8 hours, and some $12 hours and all the rest. It turns out, if you only work for me for the $8 hours, are you the hours that you could get $8 for? 
and I'm paying you $15 an hour. It turns out that you're doing very nicely in the sense that you're making $7 more per hour, but you're not maximizing your well-being because you can still work for me for an hour that someone else is paying you $14 for. If I pay you $15, it's worth your doing, right? It's an extra dollar you would not otherwise get. So it's not that you try to match, you know, you try to get the highest, the, the cheapest hours at the highest rate. You work every single hour up to the hour where the, the cost of that hour is exactly equal to the wage that I'm paying. It's the same principle again and again and again. So that's what you do. If you work any less, you forego this triangle of extra profit here. If you work one hour more, it's insane. You'd be working for me for $16, $15 an hour when somebody else is willing to give you $60. You wouldn't do it, okay? So that defines this marginal, for the competitive firm, price equal to marginal uh, cost defines the optimal output. And given the optimal output, this is a little bit sloppy here, you find at that output, I want the average cost at that output, and it is raised here, right? If I've got it, that's not going to And again, I remind you, again and again and again and again, it is not at the minimum. Let's, I, I'm gonna, uh, da, 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 da. I'll make it a little more obvious for you in just a second. Okay, suppose this was the price. So there, that was the price. This would be, wait a minute, this would be the output right here. Right? Price equals marginal cost. What is the average cost of that output? What you do not want to do, and by the way, many will do, and on this exam, I can probably know that half the class will do this, unless they're paying attention. This is not the average cost at that output, because that's the average cost at this output. The average cost at our output is right there, right? So therefore the economic profit, and it is an economic profit in this case, is this area right there, which must be drawn carefully and correctly, right? And in any case, when we do all that, we realize that the marginal cost defines the supply curve of the individual firm, except for the fact that the firm does not produce below minimum average cost, minimum average variable cost. Because, again, simple example, I will operate my restaurant even if I'm not covering all my fixed costs. Supposing I borrowed $100,000 and I'm going to pay that back. And of course I do, that's my fixed, my fixed cost. It might be the expected return on a million dollars that I might have invested, but I might be, I might be paying $100,000 in rent. I need to make that. So long as my price is greater than my variable cost, so long as at the end of the day I can pay my workers and cover my fuel and heating and other such costs in my restaurant to keep it open, I continue to operate the restaurant. Right? Because I'm covering my labor and fuel costs, which means I'm getting something extra to defray my fixed costs. However, if I can't cover my labor costs, being open costs me even more than my fixed costs and I shut down. Now here's the tragedy in Toronto. I think, as an explanation of some of the things in the world, some of you people might even think of voting for Rob Ford, which of course is completely inconceivable to me. He's just the latest twit that we somehow managed to get him as a mayor for various reasons. We used to have another one called Mel last night. He was almost as bad. The guy was almost brain dead, you know, basically. But what he did, his whole thing was, he built up North York. Oh, that was going to be him. He lived in North York, he built it up. It used to have no high rises up there or anything. This was wonderful. And he built the Shepherd Line. Before the Shepherd Line was built in Toronto for something like 15 or 20 years, the plaques exist. Toronto had the most efficient subway in, you know, the transit system in North America. And most transit systems in North America, this, the government subsidizes the transit system by about at least 50%. Our transit system is only subsidized by about 20%, at least it was in those days. It paid almost for itself. It was amazing because it operated in a sensible way. And then Mel Lastman built the Shepherd Line, which, if it was a private business, would be shut down. 
it costs a billion dollars to build, there's a hundred thousand, hundred million dollars or whatever in interest payments every year on that billion dollars, but here's the real horror show, there's not enough people on that line to cover the cost of running the trains and having people man the booths. Having that line open drains more money, it will shut down the investment. This is pitiful, but that's what we mean by shutdown. Now some, you know, some platforms do, do in fact shut down. So for example, the auto industry, when the, you know, the crash in like 2008, cars, they simply could not sell any cars. They could have sold them, but the price would have fallen so much, it wouldn't be worth it to them. They literally shut down. Toyota just shut down. They didn't produce cars for three months. You do that. You're still going to come back and produce cars, but you must wait until the price comes up. Right, everybody? So firms do shut down. But as I was saying to Eric, we're just talking, Supposing that you know we have the you know Tim Hortons in town and the price of donuts falls so low that Tim Hortons can't actually sell donuts for a price that would make it worthwhile to operate to open the doors, then they shut down. They shut down, the doors are shut. And because the doors are shut, quantity supply factors down and eventually presumably the price rises. And when the price rises, so donuts again cover the cost of the variable costs, they'll open up again. In the short run, but they learned that the Tim Dorf importance will sit there for however long it takes for that to happen, or however long it takes for them to sell the business and build a new business, right? That's our next step. So this is the background. So it turns out the supply function for an individual firm is the marginal cost function above minimum average variable cost. So we saw we're not going to draw a marginal cost, other, like we're not going to draw this tail anymore, we're going to stop it right here. Oh, sorry, I'm going to, you know, for us, for us, this, um, this was, oh this was, yeah, this should be, this is average variable. Excuse me, when I gave you this demonstration here of profit, I was treating this as if it was average cost, maybe that confused you. I didn't realize it wasn't working with average cost. But with average variable cost, we have what we have here, which is the supply function is above minimum average variable cost, okay? Now then, it turns out, just like in demand, the industry supply is the sum of all the output of the firms. So industry supply is the sum, is simply the marginal cost, some of the marginal cost of the firms. If all the firms were the same size, industry supply is just the number of firms times the marginal cost function. So it turns out, as we're going to draw in a minute, I'll do this. Um, we're going to do the industry supply, okay? So this is the whole deal, right? Now, next, we're going to do, we're going to see if you guys can do something. Mm, right here. Okay, here we are. I want you to do this. I want you to draw the equilibrium. Um, you know, the equal, the, what we we're going to ultimately call long line equilibrium. My thing to you is, I want you to draw, a, we say, by the way, the term perfectly competitive is somewhat obscure. I use it a certain way because I have a classical background. But basically it means, I would use it in this way, essentially all firms are the same size. But the way that some of like in the last 30 years has kind of changed a little bit. Uh, perfectly competitive just means the you know, competition reigns. The firms don't all have to be the same size. But for us, it's simple to say all firms are the same size. Okay? And don't worry too much about the perfectly and this and that. But perfectly just means the that everybody's a price whether they're the same size or not. But we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So basically, I will say, there's a perfectly competitive market. I want you to draw the firm and industry diagram showing an initial equilibrium with zero economic profit. So do it. Let's have it. Who will we be doing it next week? I'm going to do a lot of this today, so get fast enough.
Okay, so you're going to put cost per unit on the firm side. You don't have to say firm, but this is the cost, the firm cost, right, right here. And we're going to draw here average cost. I'm just drawing it first for, because in some ways it's simpler. This is average cost in period zero because something might change. And marginal cost, I'm going to draw like this. And you all know this minimum here means minimum average variable cost and shut down below that, right? Don't, in this exam, unless I ask for it, do not draw the average variable cost function because it just adds another function that you can mess up if you're asking to change things. Stay away from it. This is all I want to see from now on unless I specifically ask you to do something else. But in these kind of diagrams, don't go near it. Okay, good. So you draw this here, and what determines the actual price in the industry is the movement of demand and supply. Now I'll show you in a jump here what's going to happen. I'm going to say all the firms are the same size. So at this moment, please don't draw this the way I have it. I'm going to go into more detail subsequently. Supposing we have a demand function like this. Say, this is the demand function. I'll call it T0. But you know what? You can draw that, but don't draw the rest of the stuff. We just mess up the diagram. Now suppose we initially have a supply. Okay, wait, 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 I'll do it this way. One firm. Now this is, I mean this is restaurants. And this Q here is going to represent 150 or something. Let's say 200. 200 meals in a night. And there's 10, there's a thousand restaurants. No, there isn't a thousand restaurants right now. But I'm going to put over here. This is 20,000 meals. Right now, there's only 800 restaurants. And they kind of remember the scale here is different. So even though this marginal cost function is going to be the supply function of one firm, it's going to be squished. So it actually looks kind of like this. If you were looking at it, you wouldn't really be able to tell. But these two things, this should be actually going to look like that. So, uh, this, say right up here. This is the first firm. It's looking more squished because this is 0 to 200 and this is 0 to 200 right here, right? So this is the first firm. This is the second. This is the third. Now I shouldn't take the third. That's three. That's four. Everybody know they should all line up. So we're just adding first. Now right here, I'm saying there's 800 firms in the industry. So this is this marginal cost times 800 because all the firms are the same size for simplicity's sake. Now, first of all, you might say, are all the firms the same size? That seems really unrealistic in our modern world where firms can be different in size. We'll talk about that. Leave it alone for the moment. So all the firms, that's the supply function, all right? Now, for the moment, I'm going to get rid of this shape and go back to this shape so that you realize I'm literally talking about essentially the same marginal cost function. So we have here, supply in this case is for 800 firms, is 800 times the marginal cost of the typical firm. All right, now then, again, don't copy this. We're gonna see that what's gonna happen here is if you looked at this, this would be the equilibrium price in the marketplace and when we analyze the profit loss of an individual firm, they would produce here, they would make an economic profit. Okay, ready? Really? In the short run, they would make an economic profit. And what we're going to learn in the long run, and this is one of the, and I'll talk more about it as, you know, how important it is to history of economics for the long run. There will be economic profits. In the short run, that's in the long In the long run, if there's economic profits, what that means is this industry, donuts, produces as an economic profit of 50%. Whereas, uh, let's say hamburger joints have an economic profit of 10%, all right? So what do you think is gonna happen in this, in this world? Some people, or also there would be, say, let's say, uh, subways or something like that have an economic profit of 8%. Some people in subway, with subway stores are gonna 
get rid of their store, take their capital, shut their store down, take their capital, and move into the production of restaurants or donuts or whatever I'm talking about. And so what's going to happen is 